everybody, this is Eric from Airbraid, and today we're going to talk about doing tapered tangs on the surface grinding attachment. We've got some long overdue videos we need to make about the surface grinder. You guys have been asking for some more information about how to do some of the uh, special functions that beyond just the normal use of planing to thickness for parallelism, um, such as tapered tangs and fullers and bevels. Today we're going to go over tapered tangs. It's uh, something that's designed into the machine that isn't getting utilized um, when, from what we hear when we go to shows, there's a little bit of confusion about how to use the sign plates. The basic concept is that once you've got everything set up where um, you've surface ground your chuck, like your reference surface, the face of your chuck will be parallel to the motion of your bearing rails. So that means that as you come across your wheel, the gap is constant from left to right across your chuck. Um, so to achieve a taper, what you're doing is you're purposefully um, throwing, throwing that off in a way. Um, you're taking that surface and you're putting it at an angle to your motion. So I've got a, this extreme case here. You can see that as I drag across, I've got a gap on this side and the, gra the gap begins to shrink as I pull across. What the sign plate does is allow you to control that angle very accurately. So it's got a pivot point on the left and it's got two reference pins that we machine in at a very precise distance away from that pivot point so that by putting shims in here between this flat surface and that pin, you're basically creating a triangle with a very precise distance on the bottom leg of the triangle and a very precise distance on the height of the triangle. For that to be accurate, the first step is to make sure that this surface is ground parallel to your bearing rail when the flats are bumped all the way up against your pins. This chuck has been ground before, but this is our show piece that we take on the road with us. And we just took it out of some bins on, in the motorhome, all disassembled and put it back together. So who knows how precise it is. So we're just gonna make sure that it's accurate by skim cutting it again. I'll usually take a marker and I just give myself some vertical lines across the full width of the face So that was my first skin cut. It's looking pretty good most of the way across. To make sure you get the full width and you don't accidentally leave a step on top or bottom, make sure you track your belt excessively far down and excessively far up so that you know you clean up the full face of, the, of this two inch wide raised section. And we're just gonna go until we don't see any more Sharpies, taking really light cuts so we don't take any more material off of our chuck than we have to. Once this little step is gone on the chuck, it's time to replace it. I'm going to track the belt up to the top, so it's hanging over the top edge. Even though we put a hard rubber on this wheel, when you're going for flatness, you want to be taking light cuts so that you're not compressing the rubber and pushing it out of flat. You want that rubber to stay nice and flat. Are we good? Now that we've got our chuck all cleaned up, we have to determine how much of an angle we want to kick it out to. You could determine that angle in terms of degrees. We do have a little chart on here. So if you want, for example, if you wanted a two degree angle, then you would put a shim 0.175 inches thick at pin A. Um, and then 
if you move that shim to pin B, uh, it would be half of that because it's twice the distance. We'll go over more about how the doubling works later in the video, but basically whatever shim you use at pin A will give you half of that angle at pin B. However, I don't find degrees to be very useful in a lot of situations unless you've got some sort of CAD design with a specific angle in mind. Um, typically, if you're tapering the tang of a blade, you're just kind of going for a specific thickness decrease over a specific length is the way that I hear most people work and the way that I like to work. So to make that more clear, we're, we'll go over an example. We're going to keep going on a blade very similar to uh, the one Kevin used in the hollow grinding jig video, and we're going to taper this tang down. Let's look at what thickness we have to start with. I'm gonna write these numbers down for reference. Got 188, so let's just write this up here. 0.188 thick. We want the tapered section to go past our handle material so that your flat handle scale doesn't have to jog over an angle. It's gonna sit completely on a flat. So you wanna make sure your, your taper goes past wherever your handle's going to end. That'll be specific to your design. For this one, we'll call it 3.4 inches. Now we have to decide how thin do we want it to be at the um, end of the taper so we know how much we're going to take off. So this really doesn't matter, just whatever you think looks good. We'll go for a dramatic taper so that it's easy to see in the video. Uh, we'll go for 60 thousandths at the end. So the tip of our taper is going to go all the way down to oh, 60 thousandths, 0 .060. Thickness, and subtract our tip thickness, and divide that by two. That's how much material we're gonna remove from each side. 0 0.188 minus 0 0.060 divided by two equals Zero 0.064. Essentially, those numbers we just figured out, we've created a triangle. Let's draw a representation of the cross section of our blade. We're gonna exaggerate the thickness so that it's easy to see. This dotted line down the center, we're just gonna call center line. This is just looking down. We're looking down at the, the top of the blade right now. This is the thickness. And then we're going to taper down to 0 0.060. And this is all going to be over 3.4 inches. So we're removing all of this material. So let's pay attention to this shaded area right here. At the math we did right here, finding this 0.064, that was this distance right here. So let's draw just that shaded triangle on this new sheet of paper bigger. So the way the sign plate works is you're taking this smaller triangle and scaling it up to the size of the sign plate. So I'll show you what that means. So if this triangle is 3.4 inches, it's basically a scaled down version of this bigger one. We'll draw it here inside and cross hatch that the other way. So this triangle and this bigger triangle have the same proportions. So if this is 3.4 inches from here to here, which matches the blade example we're doing, and 
the height of this leg over here is 0 0.064. We just have to scale those numbers up to the same size of our si as our sign plate. Just as a reference, we'll show you with the tape measure here that uh, the pin B is 10 inches away from the pivot point and pin A is five inches away from the pivot point. Trust us, we did not only use a tape measure to verify that, it was CNC machine. We need to take these dimensions, 3.4 and 064, and scale them up to this bigger triangle with a 10 inch base. And then this leg over here is what the size of shim we're gonna use underneath pin B to get the same, the angle we want to achieve the taper we designed. So it's very simple math. Set the small triangle up on one side. And then set that, that ratio of this leg to that leg will be the same ratio of that bigger leg to this bottom leg. So you only have to do this one time. You don't have to do it for pin A because we're gonna use this same shim at pin A and we'll go over why later. You've got your smaller triangle and you've got your larger triangle on this side. Once you get these ratios set up, which is just basically telling you that, you know, the ratio of this leg to this leg is the same as the ratio of this leg to this leg. So 064 divided by 3.4 would be the same thing as this shim thickness divided by 10 inches. So all the only math you have to do to figure out what that shim thickness is, is just multiply this 10 over on the this side of the equal sign. I'll write it out so that that makes sense. We took this 10 and we multiplied it onto this side. So 10 times 0 0.064, which is the amount of material we're going to remove, divided by 3.4, which is the length of our taper. And that'll give us our shim thickness. Oh, look at that. Same thickness as our blade. To confuse people. So this is completely a coincidence, but it is very convenient that our shim thickness happens to be the exact same thickness as our blade. Which, hey, I highly recommend just choosing a taper that uses your blade thickness as a shim. That way you don't have to find anything else to use. That's the most convenient shim you're gonna have is your blade itself. Doesn't have to be that, just saying, why not? Like down to the thousand. I just picked a random length. I know. And I picked a random thickness. I was trying to think of the correlation. That, for those of you who are interested, that is the why the math works. But if you don't care about why the math works, I'll just write it out so that you can just type it into the calculator and get the shim thickness you want. If you understood the why, you can follow through the same way I did it. Or you can just plug the numbers into this formula right here. So you would take your blade thickness, Subtract off your tip thickness of how thin you want the end of the taper to be. Once you get that number, multiply it by 10, then divide it by your taper length, and then divide that number by two, and you'll get your shim thickness. I'm gonna actually show you guys that on the calculator. So we're taking our blade thickness, 0.188, and then we're gonna subtract the tip thickness, 0 0.060, it equals, we've got 0.128. We're gonna multiply that by 10. So basically just move the decimal over, now we got 1.28. Now we're gonna divide that by the length of the taper, in this case 3.4 inches. So. And then now we have to divide that by two. And there we go. That's our shim thickness right there. 0 
now that we've calculated our shim thickness, and in this case it ended up being our blade thickness, I'm not even going to bother going to find something else to use a shim. Although, I will mention, what we typically use if it came out to a random number is a set of feeler gauges. Um, if you don't know what feeler gauges are, it's just a stack of a huge variety of different thicknesses of steel that you can combine in different combinations to get basically any thickness you want within the range of your shim stack. Just pick those up off of Amazon for probably less than $5. Since I can use my blade as the shim, I'll show you where you would put that. I've got these two loose so that this whole piece pivots freely. You wanna make sure these areas are clean and then we're just gonna close up the gap and pinch on our shim, making sure we're not binding up in the radiuses over there. We just want it to be on the flats. So with that pinched, I'm going to tighten down these two screws. So just to make this easier for you guys to see, well, and for me too, honestly, I'm gonna give us some contrast with some die chem. It makes it easier to see our scribes and see where we've removed material. So we said we wanted our taper to be 3.4 inches long. Once I got two marks, I'm gonna connect the dots. So connecting the two end points that I scribed and giving myself a straight line for where the taper is going to end. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Now, when we grind the taper and approach this line, it won't be a super crisp edge like a bevel line because um, it's such shallow angles that even differences in the heights of the grit grains on the belts will kind of give you a kind of jagged edge but all that blends out as you hand sand just a good reference mark to know when to stop tapering so you go up the same height on each side and end up with a symmetrical grind now that we've got our truck kicked out at the angle we want for the first side and we've got it locked down so this isn't moving we need to place our blade onto the magnetic chuck. One thing that you need to make sure is you always need to put the, the thin side of your taper to the right, because that's the side where the gap is closing. So thin side to the right. And we're gonna use this scribe line we made to orient our blade to clock it properly on the face of the chuck. Because if you put it at different angles, then the the top of your taper is going to be at the, whatever angle you place it on here. So we want that line to be vertical on the chuck. So a lot of times what I'll do is give myself a vertical reference with a machinist square. And another tip, I like to work on the all the way to the right of my chuck because if you work over to the left side, as you approach the end of your um, taper, it's very, you've had the feed in so far, it's very possible you'll be in far enough that you could actually run into your chuck and grind into your aluminum chuck on accident and put a taper into your chuck. So you want to be doing the thinnest part of your grinding all the way on the right side of your chuck to make sure that once you fall off your blade, it, your, your grinding wheel goes off the end of your chuck as well. So that means we need to put our vertical reference line approximately right here. Let's just use a Sharpie. A fine point Sharpie would be better for this. But I don't have one. But, and it'll be easy for you guys to see the fatter Sharpie. So, I just use the machinist square to transfer a line straight down. 
when I'm trying to orient this on anything on the chuck accurately, oftentimes what I'll do is only use one magnet to start near where I want it to pivot. So right now I've only got one on, and now I'm still free to turn this so I can look from the front and get that line going straight down my reference line. Once I have that lined up the way I like, then I'll turn on a couple more magnets so that then it is not going to go anywhere. I like to stand the surface grinder up to do belt changes. It makes everything much easier. I'm sure some of you with the surface grinder have already run into this, but before you stand it up, make sure you slide the surface grinder all the way to the right. Otherwise, it'll, it'll pinch you or just break itself and slide down really fast when you stand it up. So just control this handle at least when you stand it up so that it doesn't fall. I'm throwing on an 80 grit to rough through this. All right, so I brought it in until the right side of the blade is just starting to kiss the belt. Now we can turn it on. And as we start grinding, we're gonna start removing material from the tip first. And as we feed in deeper, we'll see our taper line move up and up and up until eventually we reach our scribe line and then we'll stop. And make sure if you plan on going to a finer grit than where you're starting, leave extra material on away from your scribe line so that you have material to remove to get down to your scribe line. So we've taken a few passes now. So if you look at the surface of what we've ground, you can see it's removing material from the tip first. And we've got a line, like I said, a, a vaguely defined line moving from the right up to the left. It's such a shallow taper that it's not going to be a very crisp line. Depending on how wide your blade is, will depend on how heavy of a cut you can take. Um, you kind of have to get a feel for how much resistance you have when you're pulling across. Again, if you want everything to stay flat, you take lighter cuts. If you're in a hurry, you can take as heavy a cut as you want as long as you're not bogging down the machine. So if you look at where we're at now, as you can see, a few of the high spots of grains on the belt are starting to give me scratches that reach my scribe line. So it's up to me at this point whether I'd want to switch to a finer grit that would give me a little crisper line, um, or if I just want to run it up with uh, the 80 grit that I've got. For the sake of demonstration, we'll show you what it would be like if we switched to a finer grit at this point. So I jumped straight to a 220. We'll see if that was too big of a jump. I don't know, we may have to step back down. This belt's thinner, so I'm not even touching yet. I gotta feed in a little bit before I even reach the surface. Just taking really light cuts as I approach my line, and it's giving me a much crisper line at the top of my paper, so it'll be easy to control. Let's give it a look up close. That's pretty much it right there. Um, like I said, there's still a few high spots around the seam of the belt that gave me some scratches beyond my scribe, but for the most part, um, we're right there. Be careful, it might be warm before you just drop it into your hand. What's surprising is the aluminum chuck acts as a pretty good heat sink, and this is actually pretty cool to the touch. So we're safe to take it off. Dust off our chuck, dust off our blade, and uh, see what we've got. Now we need to flip it over. However, we need to talk this is where uh, a lot of people get lost. We have a couple couple things that might be confusing. When we flip it over, now that we've got a tapered section, um, the blade rocks on the surface. 
so people aren't sure if they should keep it um, on the original flat or on the new tapered flat. You need to keep it on the new tapered flat because that's the area you're grinding over. And if you stuck it to the original flat and ground over the taper, it would be unsupported and you'd just be flexing that thin tapered tang that you just created. So we know we need to stick down to the tapered flat, but that means that we just shifted the center line of our blade at the angle that we just ground on. So that means that now to get the, a symmetrical taper on the opposite side of the blade, we actually need to double the amount of angle now. But you don't have to redo any math, don't be scared. Um, that's what the second pin in the sign plate is for. So you can use the same shim thickness, but just move it from pin B to pin A, because like we said, we're, they're just scaled triangles. If we have a triangle over here with half the leg length, but the same height, you have double the angle. That, that's only good for small angle approximations, but since all these tapers are shallow angles, um, it's close enough. You can see in the angle chart how it's not a perfect doubling. When the smaller the angle is, the closer of an approximation it is. Down at one degree, it doubles to 2.001 degrees. Once you get up to five degrees, the doubling error is 0 0.06 degrees, which for all practical purposes is more than accurate enough. We crack these loose again. Again, holding it pinched in between with one hand and tightening the bolts with the other hand. Like I said, we can't flip left to right because then we'd be uh, thinning out the wrong end of our blade. So we have to keep the thin end to the right, so we just have to flip top to bottom. But we, now this reference line, as long as we line it up with our um, Sharpie mark that we made, we'll still get the right angle. Again, I'm gonna tack it down with one magnet, adjust the angle, and I'm gonna turn on the other magnet that's under the taper. I'm not gonna turn on the magnet over here because I don't wanna bend the blade. I'm gonna switch back to an 80 grit belt. Now that you've kicked this out, you're really gonna have to back off on your feed screw to open up the gap. And again, you just go until the tip just barely starts touching and then you're ready to go. Always advancing the screw in when the blade is on the right side of the wheel. That way I'm pulling against the cutting pressure. You don't want it to be cutting in the same direction that you're moving because it'll just pull it out of your hand and it'll be hard to control. You want your arm under tension pulling against the cutting pressure. Okay, so a few of the scratches from my 80 grit belt are starting to reach my scribe line. So it's time for me to switch to a finer grit belt. That's about the same as the other side. And check the heat before you commit to holding it. Release the magnets. And there we are, a very symmetrically tapered tang. Beautiful surface finish. Brought it up to 220 grit. Let's see uh, what we ended up with, with thick for thickness down here at the tip. 069. For me, that basically means I nailed it because I stayed a little shy of my scribe line. If you wanted uh, to get specifically down to exactly 60 thousandths, you could take a little more off. Maybe I will. I'm take a little off. Nine thousandths. Take four off at each side. Since it's 
symmetrical. I don't have to change the angle anymore. Stop there. All right, so moment of truth. Let's see what thickness we actually ended up with. We were going for a tip thickness of 0 0.060. Let's see what we actually got. Oh, 058, pretty respectable in my opinion. So that's just one of the many things you can do with the surface grinder. It's a very precise way to do tapered tangs. If you're like me and you like to have fixtures for everything, I mean, there's the special talented breed of people who can do that on a flat platen, but um, that surface finish and that precision is difficult for most people to hit. We'll do some more videos on some of the other ways you can use this attachment to really make it worth that price point. Hit that subscribe button, watch another video here, and uh, we will see you next time.